Welcome to uh, Introduction to ARM Systems. Uh, my name is Gananan Kinney. So first, I want to start off with uh, acknowledgments for people who have helped me sort of put this course together. Um, so this class is actually based on a uh, class I took uh, in school. And uh, it sort of uh, combined embedded systems introduction with uh, operating systems. Um, and Professor Rajiv Gandhi is the one who sort of uh, put this whole course together. Um, so I thought it was very valuable. Um, and I also have some material from Professor Devo Halron, who's uh, generously provided the uh, bomb lab for us. Um, I just ported it for the ARM platform. And then uh, there's Zeno, uh, Dave, Jim, and uh, Dave Weinstein. These are all people who have also helped me sort of uh, you know, um, sharpen this presentation. Um, so I just wanted to thank them. Um, this course requires uh, two uh, classes, which would be helpful, uh, which is Intro to X86, which is sort of the X86 assembly. And uh, Intermediate X86 would be helpful. And if you have any questions uh, while I'm going through the assembly code, feel free to ask. You know, uh, I'll try and explain it. There's actually two books. Uh, one of them I put up. The other one is actually uh, a website, uh, which I will uh, post the link to later on. And uh, most of the material that I'll be talking about today can be found on this book. So this was uh, sort of the schedule I had in mind for our class. Um, so we're going to start off with some ARM basics, go through some uh, introductory assembly for ARM, followed by a lab uh, where we'll be writing a Fibonacci sequence generator. And then we'll go into a little bit more detail on how the load store and memory operations work on ARM, followed by uh, basics of GDB uh, for folks who haven't worked with GDB before. And then we'll do the bomb lab. And finally, tomorrow, I'm hoping to cover uh, some of the hardware features that come with the ARM platform and uh, go through the interrupts. And uh, we'll have a simple lab where we'll actually emulate the interrupts for ARM, uh, followed by how GCC optimization works for ARM. Uh, so there are some features on the ARM platform that are more useful uh, that help optimize uh, the code for ARM platform. And We'll be following that up with uh, a control hijack uh, lab, where we'll actually do a buffer overflow. Um, and finally, we'll have um, inline and mixed ARM assembly, so how we can mix C code with ARM assembly and vice versa. And uh, we'll also look at atomic instructions. So a brief introduction about myself. I started out. Uh, doing this as a hobby in high school. Uh, I actually went to Ipswich High, and uh, I was part of the US First Robotics team. Um, this was back in 1998, maybe, so. Um, and we had, uh, and like, we had a microcontroller where we had to program it using PBASIC. And uh, so since then, though, I've taken a lot of classes uh, that are related to different sort of platforms of microcontrollers, including Motorola's MC68 C11, which was popular uh, for some time. So as I had said, I like to start off my presentations with some XKCD comics. Um, we don't realize the power that we have over these tiny little machines. Uh, so I just thought this was appropriate. <laughs> and. Uh, I wanted to do a little short review of uh, Intel x86 to get us in the mindset. So uh, who wants to tell me the uh, uh, values above in little endian? So um, endianness is uh, actually only related to how the data uh, is stored in memory or retrieved from in memory. Um, so in this case, the values, uh, hex values 3210 and 7654, um, you have to reverse the byte order for each of the uh, half words. And 
So what you'll get is hex 103.25.476. Uh, are there any questions? Everybody's pretty familiar with ending this? All right. Um, so then how do I represent nibble me ints in uh, binary and octal? So you take each uh, hex digit, right, and you convert it into binary. Uh, so each hex digit is four bits. And you can uh, just convert eight becomes one zero zero zero. It's all powers of two. And uh, you can do the same thing with four, five, and seven. So um, for octal, you take three bits at a time. And uh, since it's base eight, and you can represent uh, octal of, or hex four, five, seven, eight as uh, octal four, two, five, seven, zero. So, so uh, two's complement notation, uh, which is used for, uh, uh, I think Zeno had explained it already in his class, was for uh, using adder circuits. It makes it uh, easier to do addition and subtraction just using adders. And uh, so the two's complement, uh, you take one's complement, which is the uh, negative of the value, and then you add one. So what you get is uh, hex FEED. So uh, anybody tell me what this uh, piece of code does? So this is actually uh, what's known as a template swap, where you want to swap uh, two values in two variables. And you don't want to use a third variable. Um, so this is all being done in assembly. Um, so I just thought this was an interesting piece of code because uh, when we'll be talking about atomic operations later, uh, you know, and we want to be able to swap two values uh, atomically to ensure uh, for synchronization, things like that, this will become very important. How can we optimize the above for code size? In Intel x86 assembly, can everybody tell me? There's one instruction that does it. Thank you. Exchange. Uh, so there's the XCHG instruction, and uh, that'll do a swap within two registers. And the next question was, uh, can this macro be used for atomic operations? Uh, and as I had said, uh, this takes several cycles to execute, so it's not atomic. And uh, we'll look at atomic operations on ARM a little bit later. So today we're going to learn how uh, this C program on the left turns into assembly uh, on the right. This was uh, generated using the GNU assembler on ARM. And uh, finally, we'll see how that turns into uh, this machine code. This was uh, all. This code was actually generated using object dump, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Again. So now uh, I'll introduce a little bit about ARM. So ARM is actually Acorn uh, Computers Limited. Uh, they were founded in uh, November 1990 uh, in Cambridge, England, and uh, actually they've been around. Uh, for much before that, but they actually came out with the chip around November 1990. And it was called the Acorn Risk Machine initially. And uh, they now call it Advanced Risk Machine. Um, so, and it's, uh, as the name suggests, it's a risk architecture, which is a reduced instruction set, where the number of uh, assembly instructions that are available to you or the uh, operations that are available to you on the processor is uh, uh, less as compared to a CISC, which is uh, like an x86 chip would have. And the interesting thing is ARM only sells licenses for its design. So it doesn't actually manufacture the chips. It actually ships out these designs to vendors like uh, NVIDIA, TI, and so on. And they're usually optimized for low power and performance. And they actually enable the programmer or whoever's using the chip to um, you know, try and reduce the power footprint. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that more in detail later. So for this class, we're going to be emulating the Versatile Express uh, board, which is 
an evaluation board that ARM sells, and it's with a Cortex A9 processor. Um, and it'll be emulated using KeyMu on KVM. Um, so some things will not work because it's not been implemented in the emulator. So you've been warned. So ARM actually breaks up its designs into these architectures and families. So it can get confusing sometimes. The uh, naming convention, uh, I usually go by the architecture version because most of their uh, instruction set manuals and things are related to the architecture. The family is something that's been uh, uh, used by the <coughs> system on chip vendors who actually make these chips. Um, and for example, the ARM 9 is not really the ARM architecture version 9. It's uh, going to be ARM v5. And uh, this is actually available on Wikipedia. So, so today we're talking about uh, the Cortex profile of processors. Um, the Cortex is actually found in a lot of mobile phones that you use today. Uh, the iPhone, for example, uh, any of the Android handsets, they all use the Cortex-A profile. So ARM's now trying to differentiate themselves um, into these profiles where the Cortex-A is for application-based applications, then the Cortex-M is for microcontroller-based applications, and the Cortex-R is for real-time embedded systems. So there will be a lot of feature differences between these different uh, profiles, uh, which I'll highlight as we go on. So uh, some of ARM's features are that it actually uses something called a load store model for accessing memory. So x86, you are able to directly access memory and perform operations on uh, things in memory. But ARM uses something called load store, where you, where you have to actually load the value from memory into a register, operate on it, and then store it back. So um, one of the other features we'll see is you can do a load store multiple where you can operate on consecutive regions in memory or consecutive registers. Um, and it's actually optimized for that. So The other uh, feature that ARM has is called an inline barrel shifter, where in x86 you had to do, uh, where you were trying to do the multiply plus add for uh, doing operations on registers directly in line in the same instruction. Here, an inline barrel shifter, all it does is it uh, divides or multiplies by powers of two. Uh, we'll look at that again a little bit more in detail later. I just want to highlight all the features. There's also 16-bit uh, and 32-bit instruction sets. And uh, this was a point of confusion last time. And uh, I'll try and clarify where exactly the differences lie. So there's two modes that ARM operates in for its instruction set. And that's 16-bit, which is called thumb. And uh, this was the old convention, actually. So 16-bit thumb and 32-bit. Uh, now they've been combined. And it's called the thumb 2. And they use both 16-bit and 32-bit in thumb mode. I'll uh, go into a little bit more detail later. And finally, we have. Uh, uh, we also have conditional execution where you can com uh, specify conditional operations in the same instruction, uh, auto increment, decrement features uh, for addressing where you can, again, like I said, you can operate on consecutive memory locations or registers. And since ARM v5, actually, they've changed to a modified Harvard architecture. Uh, it used to be von Neumann. And what von Neumann did was it shared the instruction and data lines. And now it's, uh, it's still uh, the memory. Uh, in memory, it's still shared, but the lines are still separate physically uh, on the chip. So the instruction and data lines uh, were actually shared uh, in the prior, uh, prior architecture versions, but currently they're actually uh, separate. So you'll see. Um, when you actually look at uh, the die, you'll see that there are different lines for accessing memory versus uh, instructions. Some of the extensions that will not be covered in this course are Trust Zone, which sort of is a TPM-like functionality, um, but for ARM. 
and the vector floating point uh, processor, VFP, uh, Neon, and SIMD, which are used for digital signal processing applications and things like that. I'll be focusing mostly on the Cortex-A profile, which is the application level, which is what runs on a, a lot of mobile phones today. So ARM has a total of 37 registers. Uh, this includes the bank registers. So there's 30 general purpose registers. There's one program counter, which is similar to your instruction pointer in x86. There's a current program status register. Uh, We'll talk a little bit more in detail about that later, uh, followed by the saved program status register. So whenever a, the ARM chip uh, changes modes, it can save the current program status register to the saved program status registers, uh, so that when it changes back to the original mode, it can restore it. So there are several exception modes. and. For now, I'm going to talk about user mode, which is where all the user applications run in. So, so here's the registers where in x86 you had EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX uh, for 64 bit, and um, ARM is all 32 bit, and you can only, uh, all the registers are also 32 bit, so you're going to have, you have more registers though. Uh, from R0 through R15. R15 is actually going to be your program counter. R14 is your link register, and link register is essentially where you save the program counter when you uh, jump to a subroutine or a function. And R13 is going to be your stack pointer. Uh, R13, which is labeled as IP, is not your instruction pointer. It's actually a scratch register. Uh, it's R12. And R11 is used as the frame pointer where your, or your base pointer, essentially in x86 is the frame pointer. Um, but R11 is used in ARM mode. And a lot of the code we're going to talk about today is all in thumb mode. So uh, it's actually going to use a different set of registers. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, how uh, the different modes will use the, these registers a little bit later. And finally, uh, so you have the CPSR down at the bottom, and this is the current program status register, which I'll talk about in more detail. So the processor actually has three things that it does uh, in its instruction cycle. It first goes and fetches the instruction, it decodes the instruction, and then executes it. So uh, it's it, this will actually tie into something uh, that we'll cover later, which is a unique feature for ARM called pipelining. Uh, and pipelining allows you to essentially queue up multiple instructions. And while it's going through one of these stages, you, uh, it can in parallel be doing a decode and in parallel be doing an execute. So you can actually queue up instructions. Uh, we'll see the advantages, disadvantages of that a little bit later. But for now, it's just fetch, decode, and execute. That's all the processor is doing. I thought I'd highlight on this slide what the differences are between ARM and x86. So the endianness, um, ARM is supposedly by endian but um, actually the instructions are always going to be in little endian So Cortex-A processor will use little endian for memory accesses and registers and things like that. So the only exception is on the Cortex-R profile, where which is the real-time processor. And there, actually, you are allowed to, uh, it's actually implementation defined, which means that whoever the system on chip vendor is, and they, they will take the design and uh, morph it into their own little uh, processor, right? And they have a bit that they set for saying, this is the endianness you get. And you can get a big endian processor. The MC68 C11, which was a microcontroller, actually ran on big endian. But uh, for all intents and purposes, whenever uh, we look at instructions today, it's all going to be in little endian. The data endianness is mixed. And there's a bit in the CPSR called the EBIT for endianness. And there are two instructions that you can set the endianness for. And 
ARM has uh, tried to make it easy for the application developers where even if you uh, save the data and then change the endianness mode, it actually has a hardware implementation when you switch mode to actually read the value back and get the original value. So in the hardware level, it actually changes the memory access that it performs. So it can get a little bit confusing. So, uh, But by default, we use little endian. There's also fixed length instructions. ARM is a 32-bit uh, it uses a 32-bit instruction set, so it's always uh, going to be 32 bits uh, for instructions. You can use 64-bit uh, uh, values for data, but we'll get a little bit more in detail to that later. ARM also has shorter instruction execution times because obviously you have a reduced instruction set, and you're going to have uh, simple instructions that do something in very little time, essentially. So it's actually the instruction execution time I'm talking about is the one instruction takes how many cycles. On x86, you have complex instructions that will take multiple cycles. On ARM, you'll have a shorter uh, instruction time. There's also register differences, like we saw earlier, where register 0 through 15, um, and they're being used differently. Uh, as compared to x86. The stack pointer is R13, things like that. Uh, also, the architecture is a load store architecture where you have to load the values from memory into the registers, operate on them, and then store them back. And we'll get a little bit more into detail on pipelining and interrupts and processor modes. And then we'll also look at some uh, code and com compiler optimizations. Again, I'm going to keep repeating a lot of stuff and uh, just so I can emphasize it a little bit more in detail. Um, so ARM data sizes, uh, ARM uses a 16, uh, a 32-bit instruction set, which uh, also means that you can use 16-bit instructions in thumb mode, but the size is still going to be 32-bit uh, for most of the ARM instructions. There was some confusion before, for me anyway, on what sizes x86 used. So it was all, I found out it was because uh, Microsoft used a convention, and then they sort of stuck with it. So a byte in ARM is actually 8 bits. A nibble is 4 bits. Uh, it's a car in x86. Um, a half word is 16 bits, 2 bytes. And uh, it's being called a short or a word in uh, x86. And word is 32 bits on ARM. So a word in Microsoft x86 is 16 bits, but a word in ARM is actually 32 bits. And a double word is 64 bits. So it should be pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, so when I say word, it's 32 bits. When it's a half word, it's 16 bits. And a double word is 64 bits. So I just wanted to cover. Uh, Really briefly, uh, this is actually its own class uh, for x86 called the life of binaries. So how does a, a program start out, you know, and how does it get converted into this uh, uh, machine code? Is It starts off with the programmer writing a C program or a C++ program. It gets compiled into uh, assembly code. Uh, generally, uh, you know, compilers will try and uh, go direct do all these things in one, like GCC does. Uh, but there's these steps that happen. So the compiler takes the code, translates it into assembly. An assembler takes the assembly code and then generates objects uh, or machine code. And then the linker actually takes uh, uh, static and dynamic objects and then puts them all into an arrangement for loading into memory. And then finally, the loader will take that and load it and actually prepare it for the OS to run that process and uh, memory. So what we're going to use for this class is all going to be GCC. So GCC will do the compiling, the assembling, linking, and um, actually uh, and loading for us. And uh, we'll actually, um, there are some other ones out there. We can use the GNU assembler, GAS, uh, for assembling and just getting the assembly files. Uh, 
but you can also use GCC for the same thing. So, so when you get this ARM board, uh, you know, ARM implementation, what happens at power? Right. So um, on a PC, you have something called a BIOS, the basic input output uh, system, where you, it actually is able to load the operating system into memory and take care of a lot of things for you. Um, but on an ARM board, you have a read-only memory chip that actually is uh, given to you by the system on chip vendor, which runs a bootloader. And ARM actually has its own sysboot manager uh, for uh, doing its own bootloader. But all a bootloader does is it loads the operating system from memory, uh, or, I mean, from uh, the ROM and loads it into uh, DRAM, which is the uh, actual memory on the ARM chip. So talking about, uh, I'll talk a little bit more in detail about the memory uh, organization later. ARM uses something called memory mapped I.O., which means all your peripherals and all the devices that you connect, other chips that you connect to the ARM board, are actually um, accessed using memory. So for example, if you wanted to access a serial buffer or an A to D converter, you would access a memory address and it will give you the value um, in, that, uh, in that buffer, essentially. So you can do volatile memory accesses to gain access to these peripherals. And you also have uh, something called GPIO, which is a feature of ARM that lets you uh, access hardware peripherals. So what does the ROM contain? Um, the ROM actually has code for setting up these memory controllers. So whenever TI sends you an OMAP 4460 board or any sort of ARM processor board, it actually comes with the bootloader and it also comes with um, code for setting up your memory uh, regions, which we'll look at a little bit more later. And uh, it also uh, does things like initializing the hardware for clock, timer, things like that. And then it starts up the bootloader. One of the bootloaders that we'll look at for this class is U-Boot, uh, since it's open source. And this one I actually got from uh, Francesco Balducci's site. Um, he has, he's actually emulated how U-Boot works on uh, Kimu. So U-Boot's interesting in that it actually moves itself in memory from one location to another. Um, and this is so it can modify the kernel, it can modify a lot of things um, for itself. So we'll actually do a lab uh, for this. So if you guys have uh, your VMs, I'll start it up. So what I've done is I've actually written a script that takes the Linux kernel, it's a 3x, 3.x kernel um, for Linux. And it actually uh, has that in a binary image alongside a root file system. The root file system actually contains uh, BusyBox, which is a minimal set of Linux user land utilities. Uh, and I just basically put these binaries together um, for you so you can actually see how UBoot works. So on the VM, So the password for the VM is actually a password with a zero uh, for those of you who are remote. So if you go into the home uh, projects directory, there's uh, something called U-Boot exercise. So as you can see, this directory actually has the rootfs. So it's essentially busybox utilities alongside with a few extra folders that I created, like dev, prop, sys, so that the Linux kernel can actually do. Um, and it's just generated this uh, latch.bin, which is the binary image that you can put uh, 
And so this works on a lot of uh, different ARM boards that you get. So you can just load this binary and tell U-boot to load the There's kernel from this binary about, uh, and uh, the root file system. The so now um, the way to run, so there were a couple of changes that Francesco Balducci actually made uh, to KeyMu so that it would, uh, so we could emulate uh, U-boot on top of KeyMu. So. But this just gives, uh, Gives a feel for what what it would look like on an actual board. So if you just run uh, I'll explain sort of what the options are here. So So all I'm saying is uh, Kimu is an emulator that you get. Uh, it's open source that you can download. Uh, on, and I'm running an Ubuntu uh, 10.04 distribution, 64-bit. Uh, and you can run Kimu, ARM, and then all I'm saying is use the versatile PV model. And so Kimu has these sort of ARM models built in uh, that it's been coded for. So you can use uh, Versatile Express. Um, and there are a couple of boards. And I, was, I actually had a hard time getting this one. So, um, But they've been doing a lot of great work on trying to get these evaluation boards so for people to emulate. So I'm using the Versatile PB model. Uh, and I'm giving it 128 megs of RAM for this machine, for, uh, for the VM. And then I'm saying, uh, use my flash binary, which has my kernel and the root file system embedded inside it. And uh, use the SCDIO for serial input output into the VM. You need an A in versatile. Oh, am I missing that? Thank you. So the interesting thing that you can actually see is here. So you can see that uh, U-boot starts off, right? Um, and it actually is uh, using hex 10,000 as the load address for the kernel image. And it's loading the RAM disk, which has our uh, root file system at uh, hex 800,000, right? So if you look, uh, so it's actually taken the flashed up binary. So Kimu, when it loads up, it puts the entire uh, binary that you give it into hex uh, 10,000. And then U-boot, what U-boot does is it moves itself from hex 10,000 to some other area in memory. And that's actually configurable in the source. Uh, you can tell where you would, should go. So, um, and it does this so it can modify things in memory, essentially, and load stuff into memory. And then it loads the Linux kernel into hex 10,000, because that's where Kimu starts executing. Right? Um, this is just an emulator, so it'll just start executing at hex 10,000. Then it moves the root file system into hex uh, 800,000. And so you can sort of see that here. And here, uh, in the emulator, if you press enter, you have um, a, a basic root file system, right? And if you do ls bin, these are all the busybox utilities. You can actually see uh, busybox there, right here. So. So all these are actually just uh, symlinks to BusyBox. And uh, BusyBox has implemented all these utilities. So any questions here? So on, on an actual ARM board, you can actually um, load U-boot uh, into an area of memory where the ROM will actually tell the chip to start executing from. 
And then you can actually run commands to configure uBoot uh, to say, run this kernel at this address. So the command for that is actually boot m address. And uh, so it's pretty simple. ARM actually has their own boot bootloader, but a lot of system on chip vendors will customize it for their own uh, needs. So does this give you guys a feel for how sort of the power on boot up process works on ARM? So there's no BIOS again, like I said, so it's all in memory. So, so this I talked about a little bit. Um, so U-Boot tends to relocate itself, which is sort of an interesting feature for a bootloader uh, that I haven't seen before. So. so we'll talk a little bit about the organization of memory. And the memory map, which is what it's called, uh, is sort of different from uh, the system on chip vendor, uh, the system on chip vendor's implementation of the ARM design. So a lot of uh, system on chip vendors will include their own hardware peripherals. They will have other uh, ARM chips on the same board that will be tied into these, uh, uh, tied into one another. So they'll, they'll have different memory maps. So the one that we're using is the RealView PBX. Uh, okay. So for the PBX A9, actually, this actually is the memory map. So if you look down at the bottom, uh, you'll see from hex uh, 0 to hex uh, like 100 or 1 billion. So you'll have uh, DDR SDRAM. So that's actually the DDR SDRAM memory that's uh, tied into the ARM chip uh, using metal lines, right? And so whenever you want to access memory, uh, if you access this address space, since you have 32 bits for addressing, you'll have 0 to FFFFF. Um, you'll, you'll be able to access uh, DRAM from 0 to 1 million. And then the FPGA peripherals, if there are any, are tied into a separate address space starting at 1 million up to uh, Ten million, so it'll be ten million two hundred thousand, I think. So that's for the FPGA peripherals, and a lot of these system on chip vendors will have things like timers on the board. So the timers, actually, you can see timer zero, one, uh, two, and three is in that address range, and you can actually access the value of the timer by accessing that memory location. This was sort of what I was referring to earlier as memory mapped I/O. You also have uh, UART devices, uh, UART 0 through 3 for the PBX board. Uh, there's something called a watchdog timer, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, and then you have a lot of other peripherals like GPIO. GPIO can be used for accessing external signals um, and actual hardware uh, can be hooked up to these uh, GPIO ports. So you, you can have things like an analog to digital converter, which takes an analog electrical signal, converts it into a digital value, stores it in this memory location. Um, so this is the Cortex-A9. Now the other interesting thing that you'll note is the SMC region, which is uh, starting at 400 million and uh, goes to 600. So SMC stands for secure monitor call. And it's uh, an implementation for Trust Zone, actually, which is the TPM equivalent, uh, you know, on the in the ARM world. And you actually have a separate memory space for Trust Zone, uh, which you can access after you've used SMC call, um, and it gives you access to this secure, supposedly secure, uh, memory location, right? And you have sort of the same uh, memory mapping going on there, too. So you can tie in other peripherals in Trust Zone, or you can tie in other things in the secure region of space. You can do your crypto implementations uh, in FPGA. You can hook those up here, too. So any questions here? Those are sort of the two things I wanted to highlight are the FPGA peripherals and the uh, Trust Zone extensions. So just to show you how uh, it 
differs from different vendors. So this is sort of a generic Cortex M3 memory map. Um, so you can see that uh, here, the RAM is actually at uh, 200 or 20 million, starting at 20 million and goes up. And the peripherals are at a, uh, 40 million. So the FPGA peripherals would start at 40 million. And you have these sort of allocations of memory. Um, there's also ARM chips come with a uh, virtual memory um, implementation using an MMU, a separate hardware MMU that's available on board. And it can be used to do all these sort of um, configurations. So and the ARM architecture actually, you can see that uh, there's actually a lot of optimizations that are built in. Um, you can do things like branch prediction, where it tries to predict where the next branch is going to occur um, in your code and actually tries to queue up the appropriate uh, instructions so they're ready um, to be executed. And as we've talked about before, this sort of ties into our instruction cycle. So what the ARM processor will do is it will load an instruction from memory, which is in the fetch stage. right? And uh, while it's uh, fetching one instruction, if it's already loaded another instruction, it'll be decoding that one, um, and so on and so forth. So what happens is the first instruction gets fetched, and when it gets decoded, the second instruction will be fetched in parallel. And so you can sort of see how it can queue up all these instructions. The only problem is since uh, we can't, uh, the branch prediction will actually make it difficult for the ARM processor to figure out what's the next instruction to fetch. You know. Because uh, you can have the branch be conditional, in which case you can't predict where it's going to go. There are lots of optimizations, and it's meant for a computer architecture class, I guess. Um, so next, I'll talk a little bit about the program counter. So as we had seen earlier, it uh, fetches the instruction uh, that's listed in the program counter, decodes it, and executes it. So the program counter actually points to the area of memory where uh, the instruction to be executed is. And normally, this points to uh, two instructions ahead. And this is because of the way that the ARM does its instruction cycle. right? So it actually, when it's executing one instruction, it, it, it'll have decoded one prior instruction, and it'll be fetching two instructions before. So because of this, you'll have an ARM, uh, in ARM mode, it actually points to the current instruction being executed plus eight bytes um, versus uh, in thumb, where it'll be plus four, because it's two bytes per instruction in thumb, 16 bits, and it's uh, four bytes for each ARM instruction, so eight bytes. So when you actually write to the PC, uh, something called a pipeline flush occurs, where wherever instructions have been queued up, it has to wipe it out because now it has to, it's jumping to an unknown piece of uh, memory for code, and it has to start lining them up again. So uh, whenever the PC is directly written to, which you can do, uh, it will flush the pipeline and it will cause a branch to occur to that address. And the thumb instructions, which are 16-bit instructions, can't be used to modify the PC. Uh, we'll talk, talk a little bit more in detail about that in the differences in ARM and thumb mode. So I just want you guys to keep this in mind in the back of your head. So, so what does this mean? Um, so this means that uh, in ARM mode, I mean in thumb mode, which is what this example has, um, if you're executing an instruction at hex 8382, it will actually, the PC will be pointing to 8386. And you'll see this actually in uh, an example later on, and we'll look at it in the interrupts lab again. So, so when you, whenever you have interrupts occurring, it will actually, this will come in very handy. So, so conventions for ARM assembly. Um, so generally, and ARM instruction is written in the AT&T syntax, if you will, where you have the 
the instruction followed by the, desti uh, the destination register followed by the source register. So it's uh, sort of opposite to if you're used to x86 assembly. Um, and ARM now comes with something called a unified assembly language where it combines 16-bit instructions with 32. So you will have 16-bit and 32 instructions right next to each other. And uh, what, it, uh, what the processor is actually doing is it's actually using half-word aligned memory accesses to access 16-bit uh, instructions. And then it, it checks the encoding to make sure that, hey, is this a 32-bit instruction? If the encoding says it is, then it actually reads the next half-word and combines, the, combines it with the first one to say it's a 32-bit instruction. So there's actually encoding involved. I'll get into detail again later. And we'll see that in the labs, too. So, so load store architecture, again, means you cannot operate directly on memory. Uh, you have to load the value from memory into register, operate on it, and then store it back. So most of the instructions uh, expect the destination to be uh, first, followed by the source. And there are uh, some confusing things that we'll look at a little bit later, like uh, loading and storing, mem storing into memory. Those instructions uh, can be confusing because you don't know which direction the data is flowing. So, so whenever I talk about uh, registers, I'll be using this <coughs> convention. So when you see an instruction with DST, I usually mean the destination register. Source is the source register. Uh, reg means just some generic register. And M means immediate value, which is any um, integer value that you can use. Um, and then followed by, uh, if I have a pipe symbol with a CXFC, that means the specified flag is affected uh, during the instruction. So just keep that in mind. So now I'll cover conditional flags. So whenever an instruction takes place uh, or it gets executed, you'll have these flags, which are actually located in the CPSR register that we talked about earlier. So the CPSR register, if you look on the board, or um, for folks remotely, you can actually see it. It's in the slides. There are these flags that get updated whenever an instruction is executed. Um, and there are actually suffixes to the instructions that you can specify to say, update the flags, or don't update the flags. And that suffix is S. So if you take any instruction, suffix it with an S, it'll usually update the flags. And if it's not suffixed, it will not update the flags. And a lot of the logical operations that we'll see later take advantage of the flags a lot. So we'll see that in more detail. So the N flag is the negative flag, uh, which indicates uh, the result was negative. And it's based on the uh, bit number 31 of the result. If it's uh, in two's uh, integer, uh, two's complement notation. So it'll use the 31st bit for setting the negative flag. The Z means the result was a zero. So, um, and the C means there was a carry that occurred during an add. Uh, v is the overflow flag, where if you go above the max integer or go below the uh, low, smallest integer, right? The, uh, for in two's complement notation, it'll set the overflow flag. And the Q is actually a sticky overflow, which means um, when you're doing uh, operations on consecutive uh, uh, memory regions, you know, and you want the flag to stick around after the operation, it's uh, unless you explicitly set the Q flag uh, or reset it, uh, it'll actually just save that value in that bit. So the Q is just like the V. And they're not updated unless you specify the S. So this is what it looks like. We'll talk a little bit more in detail about the mode. But the, some of the bits that are in the CPSR that we just covered are uh, right here, actually. So bit 31 is the negative flag. 30 is the zero flag. 29 is the carry flag. 28 is the overflow, and 27 is the sticky overflow. So the question was, uh, how does the sticky overflow flag get reset? You actually have to write to the sticky bit um, 
to reset it. The other ones just get updated with subsequent instructions. The other uh, interesting thing you'll note here is the IFT. The I is the IRQ interrupt mode. Uh, F is a fast interrupt. Uh, and T is the actual state, whether it's in arm mode or thumb mode. So we had talked a little bit about that earlier, where arm mode is expecting only 32-bit instructions. So you're going to do 32-bit memory accesses uh, versus thumb, where it actually does half-word uh, or 16-bit instruction accesses. 